In a recent article, the author describes three traits of an entrepreneurial mindset as being solutions-oriented, adaptable, and anti-fragile. I thought the first two fit within an intuitive understanding of their meaning, but anti-fragile caught my attention and is worth exploring. The dictionary.com definition of the term relates to things that become more robust when exposed to stressors or uncertainty or risk. To help with our understanding, the author dissects the anti-fragile trait into four parts. First, the heart. Be bold, confident, and resolute. Second, the head. A metaphor for our minds. Having a plan to confront change or adversity. Third, the hand. Convert the head's knowledge into getting things done. And fourth, home. Know what to do, have the ability to do it, and build a community that can help you get the necessary resources. Consider these entrepreneurial mindset traits as we listen to our guest, Oliver Vasquez. He's a New York Institute of Technology alum and founder of Vasquez Integrators. Oliver shares his intrepid journey from the Dominican Republic to growing up in the Bronx and graduating from New York Tech in 2012. After developing extensive experience and credentials, he created Vasquez Integrators, a successful technology solutions provider. We'll talk about how he overcame obstacles and discovered solutions to facilitate attending NYIT, found mentors, and worked to understand the intricacies of network design, implementation, and systems integration for various customers in the regional transportation sector. You'll see how Oliver's journey demonstrates an entrepreneurial mindset and reflects its various traits, which I'll analyze in the Lessons Learned segment following our interview. Oliver, welcome to our podcast series. Hi, John. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here with you today. I'm glad you could be here to share your experiences. You and I had an opportunity to discuss your background and in reading about you, your journey to become an entrepreneur involves a lot of persistence and resilience and adaptability. Too many adjectives to really add more color to what was a great story. From a humble beginning to entering college, finding your way to starting a career in technology, and seeing opportunities that led to opening your business. Tell us about that journey and what led you to create Vasquez Integrators. Sure, John. I mean, I think the other thing after that, I got to go back to the beginning. Back 20, 2003, my mother and my brother come to the United States and, you know, with the purpose of, you know, pursuing a better life and uh, hopefully get more opportunity in our situation back in the Dominican. My mother saw that we needed to move here. So I come here in 2003, eighth grade. I start school here, middle school, pretty much only speaking Spanish because I did not know English. Then start high school, exclusively Spanish. I went to a, a high school in the Bronx called Samuel Gompers High School. Then in the 10th grade, I saw again that I would be taking all my classes in Spanish. And I tell my counselor, please switch me to English only. That's one of the first challenges I encounter, you know, of course, the language, right? Different culture, different language. So I started taking all my classes in English in the 10th grade. So imagine taking science, learning math, learning history <laughs> in, in a language that, you know, it's not your language from for childhood. So fast forward, I graduate. Uh, well, well, before that, you know, this school, Summer Gompers, was a vocational high school. So it was more about the trade. Some people were learning about fixing computers, which I learned. Some were learning about me mechanical stuff, which it was in my field. And also, you know, IT and telecom. So that's cool. You know, open my eyes to using a computer. I did not have one growing up in the Dominican Republic. So I learned how to use one. I learned about the insides of it. So I kind of sparked an interest in this field, in computer science, in telecommunications, in IT. Come graduation time, I am selecting universities. And this school, the New York Institute of Technology, called my attention, big time. I said, this is the school that I want to attend. You know, so I submitted my application. My SAT scores were not the best. So they took a long time to get back to me. So I called the admissions office and I tell them, I am very interested in attending this school. I will work very hard. I will study hard. Please give me an opportunity to attend here. And long and behold, John, they approved me on the spot. The person said, your SAT scores are not as high as we would like them to be. So you're going to have to, you know, take remedial English, remedial math, blah, blah, blah. And so I did. 
and they have kept it. Along that way, though, you encounter the fact that now, all right, now you've got to come up with tuition. And I know that you, uh, <laughs> you, you really had to solve that problem. I did not think about tuition at all, John. I said, well, maybe the state will help me pay for it. Well, lo and behold, come September, I am at the bursar's office, and they tell me, okay, well, this semester is going to cost you $12,000. And I said to myself, well, I am the only one working at home. I am supporting my mother. I have, uh, I'm, I'm working at a clothing store. You know, imagine making, you know, the minimum $10 or whatever you work at the time, and it's just me working, you know, supporting my mom. So I'm here just talking to everybody at the birth office, trying to find out how I can get a scholarship or funding from where I'll learn about the different options. And I encountered this gentleman, Jose, who told me, have you heard of the Higher Education Opportunity Program, H-E-O-P? And I said, no, what is it? So he explained to me, it's the state initiative for underprivileged minority groups for mentorship, uh, you know, assistance, intuition. Again, by talking to people, asking the right questions and being informed, I was enrolled in this program, the Higher Education Opportunity Program, and I had to take out some loan, normal, right? But at least I was able to go to the school and not have a lot of debt. So this program provided me with the mentorship that helped me with my remedial English and math. It allowed me to start a university at NYIT. Yeah, so you were bitten by the technology bug while in high school. You overcome getting into college, into NYIT. You meet the right people. You ask the right questions. Now you're at NYIT. And, and tell me how you progressed through that. And, and one of the things I, I noted you and I discussed was also taking advantage wherever you could to get more out of your education beyond just the classroom. That's right. So I realized that here in America, a lot of students feel that, oh, yeah, you go to school and you're automatically, after year four, you're going to have a job, right? In my mind, that's not how I saw things. I said to myself, before graduation, I needed to have things lined up. So what I did, John, I started studying for some industry certifications while going to school, while working full-time, Saturdays and Sundays. So I, I was studying a, a certification called Statistical TCNA, mm -hmm. which is a big industry certification, very well known, and the CompTIA Network Plus. So I had achieved those two certifications by my senior year, and I had already worked on three industries. So the first one, 2010, I worked for free at the MTA for four months. It was very difficult for me to work for free in those times, John. You know, very difficult. I was the only one working at home, like I said before, and, you know, it was just, you know, taking care of my mom, living in our apartment in the Bronx. So I worked for free at the MTA for four months. Then I applied for another internship at the School Construction Authority, where I worked for a year and six months. And this agency is in charge of both a building public schools. So my role was to go around and service people's networking and cell phone issues. So I was a telecom intern there, right? So mm -hmm. I would meet these architects, I would meet these engineers, and I would see these plans under that, all the stack of paper. You know, and that really inspired me to see engineering as a as a career. So more like a like, like technology background myself, telecom, electrical, and then I'm seeing, hey, architecture, engineering, those two merge well together. So fast forward into my senior year. Oh, and my, by the way, this is also, meanwhile, I'm working at a clothing store, which is Express. It's a clothing store in Fifth Avenue. I was working at Express, you know, working like 25, 30 hours a week, interning at the school consortium authority for about 14 to 16 hours a week and also going to school full time. So I fast forward to senior year and I meet the professor. You know, I pretty much, I think I made an impression on him that I was, you know, self-driven. He told me that there could be an interesting opportunity on the company, which is Parsons Brinkhoff, WSB, a big engineer firm here in, in Midtown. Well, guess what? I made the case again. I said, okay, well, I'm going to draft a resume with all my certifications, all my stuff, and uh, so you can, you know, pass it on to HR, whatever. So I start my third internship at Parsons Rankov. This is like two months before graduating. I graduated in May, top of my program on the telecommunications engineering program. I pretty much accomplished what I set out to because my goal was have a full-time job before graduation and 
By the time I graduated, John, they turned me into a full-time employee, a PPWSP. One of the things that certainly comes through as we're talking about this, first off, your passion for it. I mean, you, as we said earlier, you got bitten by the technology bug, but you made a plan for yourself. You had a vision for yourself. At every turn, at every opportunity, you said, you know what? I'm going to take this opportunity to become certified in this. I know that that's important in the industry. And then also in terms of meeting people and then turning those chance meetings or impressing people enough to show that you've got drive and passion for what you do. And I think that's so important, even before you graduated from college. So you're now working at an engineering firm. And what was the transition like from working at an engineering firm now? You sort of explored additional opportunities. Is that right? Absolutely. So I felt that I didn't know anything. So starting off, despite having certified in a couple of industry certifications, I saw that I needed to learn so much. So my goal then, I had already decided to leave the clothing store, right? To put that behind me and focus full time on my new venture here with the big firm. So I was working 50, 60, even 70 hours on at some point. You know, pretty much volunteering for as much as I could, getting as much exposure to projects as I could. And my boss, who was my mentor, my professor, I, I started gaining his trust. He began giving me more and more and more assignments. I realized that a lot of the engineers there were doing their own design using this program called AutoCAD. Well, guess what? I found that NYIT offered AutoCAD training classes. So I went and I did two semesters of AutoCAD training. So now any design work that I was responsible for doing, I was doing it myself. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to, to give my say, design to a drafter. I was doing the drafting myself. So because of that, I kept getting more and more assignments my way, which, which enabled me to learn more. And I continued working on certification and I got another Cisco certification while, while there. From there, you moved on. I know you and I discussed this. Your boss left, and here you are still working at this engineering firm. And then you got an offer, right? So, yes. About a year and six months in me working at the firm, my boss leaves. You know, I pretty much was aware of five different projects. So the person that replaced him was asking me for status, was asking me for how we're going to get this done. And I just went behind the year engineer here, planning to this, you know, higher up the status of project, which made me feel pretty good. But six months later, my ex-boss, he reaches out to me and says, hey, Oliver, I formed my own company and I would like you to join me. You know, I bring this home. I talk to my mom about this. I asked my sister, I asked a few people, and not everyone was thrilled about me leaving this big engineering firm. You know, they're like, are you crazy? You're going to go from this big firm, which is going to build your future, to one person company, and you know what's going to happen. But I knew, John, I have faith that this person had given me this opportunity before, and I knew that I could maximize it. I knew that I was going to learn way more by being in a small environment, small team, a lot more responsibility. So I decided to join him, and I was with him for four years. And we grew his company from himself and I to a team of 10 people in a matter of three years. And so you're at the company. And I know, I guess, from a business perspective, it was having some difficulty. And then you made a decision to form your own firm. Is that correct? Yes. I saw that he was hiring more people than we needed. I saw that he was very technical, but there were some things business-wise, efficient-wise, that were not smart. And lo and behold, I see myself working without a paycheck for about six months done. And mind you, so I saw this man as a father figure. I saw him as a mentor. So he could do no wrong to me, right? But I hit a crossroad. said, I've been working for this long with him for so long. I've already helped him as much as I could help uh, build a, a firm company. And there's financial trouble. And I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Right. You didn't have the confidence that he could turn this thing around. No, I did not have the confidence. I said to him, you know, with a lot of regret, and I was feeling bad. I said, I can no longer continue. He acted like he understood, but I can tell that he felt some type of way about it. So, you know, our relationship there, you know, would part of weight. And um, here I am around November, December 2017, thinking, what do I do? Do I go apply for this big company, 
maybe, you know, I, I'm sure those people will definitely have me. I know other engineering companies will definitely have me. Maybe the general construction companies that we were doing some contracting for will definitely have me. But you know what, John? I said, I have six months work of saving. I lived at the Bronx during the whole time, right? So I was able to save some money. And I said, I have six months worth of saving. I'm going to give it a shot. I know there are some incentive government programs like becoming a minority business enterprise. So essentially, on any government construction contract, there is a mandate where if the project is funded by dollars, by taxpayer dollars, you have to give a percentage of that contract to either a woman-owned or a minority-owned firm. So I'm going to form my company. I'm going to certify it as a minority-owned firm, and I'm going to provide services like I was with my previous boss to the consumption industry. And um, my first client was to plan a fitness gym in a very small contract, about $10,000. Then one of the previous projects that I was working, the general contractor contacted me saying, Oliver, I know you were the one working on this project, so why don't you give us a call for how much you can charge us in time to complete this project? And John, that was it. That started me on the path with the MTA. So that was the first one, and then many more after that. Wow, that's such a great story. And it's probably a lesson for any entrepreneur, right? It's not an easy path to take, especially opening your own business. And you have to have that resiliency, that ability to overcome issues and problems. The other thing is, it sounded like you remained optimistic along the way. I would think that that's probably a lesson that you would pass on to entrepreneurs, right? Absolutely, John. I think that most people panic one facing adversity and it is normal to feel anxiety it is normal to feel fear but you can't let any of that stop you from pursuing what you think is meaningful and what you think is going to have a bigger impact in the bigger picture so thinking about your family thinking about um, what the future holds essentially pushing through on what you feel is important to you and i didn't set out thinking oh i i am an entrepreneur I set out thinking, I am going to make sure that I take care of my family. The result of that, you know, I set out to take care of those ones that I love. And it brought me to this place today. And uh, fast forwarding my firm, now five, six years old, we have a team of 10, 12 people. And I am very happy when I come in and I see my team very happy in the environment, in the culture that we've been able to build. And I know that I am impacting lives positively. That's why I also get back to NYIT. Mm. I hire interns from NYIT. I attend a seminar. I mentor. I participate in, in a, as many things as I can because I know that there, there, there are kids out there and adults out there that may be at the same place where I was at the crossroads, right? Right. And maybe someone can, get, can be inspired by knowing that, hey, someone did this already. Just got to, you know, trust yourself and and follow what makes you happy and follow what gives you significance. I also know that you advocate continually to continue funding of the programs that helped you succeed. That's correct. Our company donates, you know, when it can to to the university and HOV because we believe in what he has done. I mean, I personally benefited from that. So that's so wonderful to hear. And, you know, especially you certainly can inspire the next group of those in minority communities that feel that maybe there's not a pathway for them. But through perseverance and struggle, you come out ahead. You come out as a way of showing that, especially you, a model for those that there is a path forward and there is a path to success. So I I compliment you on that. One last question. What one word describes who you are? That's a tough one. I think I'm resilient. Resilience. I think there's uh, resiliency definitely in my DNA. I don't take no for a no. I think every no is going to get you to a yes. Right. And you can be, you know, disencouraged. That's great to hear. Thank you so much for sharing your journey, sharing your story. And I have to believe that this sort of a, our conversation today will inspire those behind you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, John. I'm happy to be here and thank you for all you do as well. Oliver's experiences match well with the three prominent traits of the entrepreneurial mindset. That being solutions-oriented, adaptable, and anti-fragile. Coming from the Dominican Republic, he could not speak English and was placed in Spanish-only classes when enrolled in a New York City middle school. 
However, when he went into high school, he requested English-only classes. And although he struggled, immersing himself in a new language was an essential step in his learning process. He attended Samuel Gompers High, a New York City technical and vocational school, which exposed him to computer technology and telecommunications that he saw as a pathway to a career. Now, through this phase of his education, we begin to recognize that although becoming an entrepreneur was not yet in the picture, the necessary traits were already being developed. Choosing New York Tech was the next step, but it came with challenges and required persistence, resilience, and self-advocacy. It started with his imploring the admissions office to accept him and agreeing to remedial math and English. Next, he overcame the cost of financing his education by enrolling in the Higher Education Opportunity Program. This gave him access to mentors who played a crucial role in his adjusting to college life and provided grants to help his tuition. Using Oliver's own words, this came about by talking to people, asking the right questions, and being informed. Once enrolled in New York Tech, he took advantage of every opportunity to gain experience and create a pathway to employment. This was especially evident in his taking on internships and earning essential industry certifications, which distinguished him from other graduates. He gained valuable experience and importantly, made contacts in the industry. Oliver's educational journey strengthened his anti-fragile nature by instilling confidence, helping him plan for adversity, knowing what to do and obtaining the skills to get things done, and then building a network of connections. This created fertile ground for him to establish and grow his own business. He took the risk of becoming an entrepreneur. The one word Oliver used to describe himself was resilient. Resilience is an innate ability to withstand and confront the difficulties of business and in life that are seen in most successful entrepreneurs. We thank Oliver for sharing his valuable experience and insights. This podcast is executive produced by John Rebecki and the New York Institute of Technology in conjunction with the School of Management and the Office of Strategic Communications and External Affairs. Our co-executive producer is Dr. Deborah Cohen, Professor of Marketing at the School of Management. Our social media strategist and producer is Petra Shantaraga. And our audio editor and mixer is Brian Falk from Abacus Entertainment. Special thanks to Professor Ellie Schwartz and John Rolicky from the Office of Development and Alumni Relations for all their support. Until next time.